the northern region of the Sudan. Enormous caravan trains once traversed the Sahara. Covering 9 million square kilometers, it's the world's largest desert. The environment here could not be more demanding. Nevertheless, it still contains a number of human settlements. At the end of this desert journey, we will encounter the legendary people of Hadendoa, the nomads of Nubia, today's Sudan. Just a few kilometers beyond Sudan's metropolis of Khartoum in Omdurman is the splendid burial place of the famous 19th century Islamic leader Al-Mahdi. He was one of the most important exponents of Sufism. It was Al-Mahdi who invaded Khartoum, a city founded by the Egyptians that was later ruled by the British. And at the end of the 19th century, he even managed to push the Egyptian conquerors from the Sudan. Today, Khartoum is the capital of the Sudan Republic. Our journey will take us from this great metropolis into the country's rural areas. Here, the automobile is almost frowned upon, thus they are few and far between. It's not surprising, therefore, that the traditional camel is still the most practical mode of transport. Outside the cities, the roads are very poor. People lead a traditional way of life in this northern region of the Sudan. Religion is also very important to them. Close to the city of Omdurman, we come across a group of Sufis, also known as Dervishes. They follow the Sufis religion that is based upon the teachings of their former leader, Al-Mahdi. The name Dervish originates from the Persian language and means bagger. However, this is not the precise meaning of the word. The word bagger is merely symbolic as it describes the poverty of the people compared to the infinite wealth of God. The dancers of the Sufis are unique. The whirling dervishes spin around until they enter a trance-like state. Their faces are a picture of total detachment as they attempt to get as close as possible to their god. Thus the legacy of Muhammad al-Mahdi and the Tariqas, the ancient order of the Sufis, has survived right up until the present day. In the 19th century, the infamous warriors of the Harandoa people were also the courageous soldiers of Al-Mahdi's army. Today, they live in the environs of the Red Sea Mountains. The camel is the only means of transport in this region. For more than 2,000 years, the camel has been an essential mode of transport for people from the African continent. Originally from Asia, these meagre-looking animals are in fact very hardy and are thus known as the ships of the desert.
On our journey to the Hadendoor tribe, we meet a number of metal workers who are well known for the outstanding quality of their products. They make weapons for the nomads. Tradition has it that each warrior be armed with a long sword and three daggers, the Kanja. The weaponry is interesting, but we require some guides who are familiar with the terrain and we also need some camels. The reclusive people of the Harandar are very proud and it will be difficult to communicate with them. However, we're in luck. Hassan, an Arab sheikh, will help us. If we are to succeed, it will be due to his skills and important contacts. Finally, after some long and hard negotiations, a deal is struck. Before embarking on our journey, we shall visit the cattle market near Sinkat. It is there that we shall purchase the additional camels that we require. Since their introduction to Africa's eastern regions, the camel has determined the life of these desert areas. They were first used as a trading commodity. Although a male-dominated society, Western women have nothing to fear in this country. We have caught the eye of the local merchants. Our strange jewellery seems to fascinate them. Following the selection of the camels, the journey follows a dried out riverbed. Up to this point, only two men have agreed to join us on this dangerous journey. Yet they both belong to the Hadendoa tribe. The first ride on the new animals is a success. Now we must return to the village to collect the rest of our luggage. While preparing for the next leg of the journey, we are hoping that during our travels we may be able to take on some additional guides. The journey across the desert won't be easy. So we take advantage of a final rest before the real journey begins. Packing the animals correctly takes time as the weight has to be distributed evenly. If this is not done properly, the long march to the Harandoa would soon harm the animals and so bring a speedy conclusion to our adventure. In addition to our film equipment, there is also our tents and food. Good quantities of water must be available on a journey like this. Food for the camels is also of great importance. Finally, our small party starts on its journey, followed by a curious group of village children. The journey to the Harindor will become increasingly challenging as we follow in the footsteps of the ancient Nubian caravans that once travelled through the desert.
Our expedition is nothing compared to the legendary Trans-Sahara caravans. At their peak, the huge caravan trains included up to 20,000 animals. Up until the beginning of the 20th century, several important trading routes led through North Africa. Those traveling across the Sahara have always had to cope with the savage climate of the desert. Both in ancient times as well as today, the overwhelming heat saps the strength of both man and beast. Here, the daytime temperature can reach a scorching 55 degrees Celsius. Unlike most of this desert, here there's still some vegetation. Along a dried up riverbed or wadi, several shady thorn trees provide welcome relief from the burning sun. Most of the Harindoa live in areas in which there are few wadis and oases. The route travels uphill and walking becomes more strenuous. But we've already covered a fair distance thanks to the experience of our local guides. Despite its savage climate, the history of this fascinating country dates back to the earliest pharaonic times. The Nubians left behind one of the oldest cultural heritages of mankind that is thought to be well over 5,000 years old. We've gradually become accustomed to the slow, rocking movement of the camels and the wooden, yet relatively comfortable saddles. At the foot of the mountain range that we must cross in order to travel deeper into the homeland of the Hadendoa, we meet a group of wood gatherers. In addition to the trading of camels and goats, the gathering and selling of wood is one of the main sources of income for this unique nomadic people. A proud people, their hair is decorated with a special comb. The combs are both decorative and practical. As they're unable to wash due to the scarcity of water here, the combs are also a means of scratching their scalp. These simple wood gatherers are a fascinating sight, but now we continue on our quest for the warriors and women of the Hadendoa tribe. We travel closer to the mountains. The scenery is becoming increasingly hilly, so tiring our camels. To renew our strength for the journey ahead, we decide to take a short break. In this region, the midday sun is unbearable, and so anywhere that can provide a modicum of shade is a welcome bonus. Our camels have more than earned a rest. But even after we've removed the wooden saddles, we still can't relax. 
Despite the shade offered in this remote wadi, the thermometer has climbed to well over 40 degrees Celsius. In such temperatures, to think of eating is impossible. However, we take time out to rest. For those not accustomed to these temperatures, it's necessary to take full advantage of these short stops. The landscape here is quite different. Indeed, even in this highly demanding climate, the surroundings here are, are quite idyllic. Nevertheless, time is precious, and so we go about our necessary tasks. We travel again. Our excitement increases as we're now only a few kilometers from the home of the Harandoa. We don't know what to expect or even how they will greet us. The camels take this opportunity to regain their strength. The journey continues along a route that is now becoming stonier and so more arduous. The scenery begins to change and the landscape becomes more fertile than that we experienced in the lower regions. Soon we have our first encounter with several armed warriors, the proud inhabitants of this mountain region. Fortunately, they show no hostility to us whatsoever. Indeed, the opposite is true as they sing and dance and give us an extremely warm welcome. Our guides tell us that, as with the wood gatherers that we met, these men do not belong to the tribe of the legendary warriors we seek. The Harandur are only a relatively small section of the nomads that travel through the south of Egypt, Sudan and Eritrea. This group of tribes known as the Beja today contains a population of almost a million. Historians and archaeologists believe that the origin of the Beja can be traced back to ancient Egypt. Although various groups have different customs, each of the Beja tribes is culturally associated with the other as they share the same Beja language. The Beja are the descendants of the Kushites, who lived in the desert region between the River Nile and the Red Sea for more than 25,000 years. Our arrival proves to be a welcome diversion for the men. To celebrate our visit, the Harandur prepare an important traditional ceremony. Here, coffee is a popular stimulant. Our 
After the coffee beans have been roasted in a small tin jar, they're ground with simple utensils. The preparation of this refreshing drink is a laborious affair. Everything is done by hand. Modern coffee grinding machines are not to be found here. Pepper is also a favoured ingredient. As a filter, the Harandoa use a tiny handful of grass which they place across the opening of a bottle-like coffee pot. After the water has begun to boil, the coffee is served. Accompanied by a small prayer, the fresh coffee is served in a tiny cup. The effect of this drink, despite its comparatively small quantity, should not be underestimated, as for the uninitiated, its intense and strange taste takes some getting used to. With newly refreshed vigour, the men prepare for a warlike performance. This traditional form of exercise is an impressive and bloodless way by which to demonstrate the ability and power of the warriors while at the same time improving their skills. Regular training with shields and swords is important as the inhabitants of this region are constantly on the lookout for the dangers posed by hostile tribes. Their jumping and attack technique appears to be somewhat awkward and is certainly not without risk. That even during these exercises injury can occur shows how seriously these people take their fighting skills. However, we're able to provide medical attention and the warrior is ready for action once again. We move on in search of a good place to spend the night. Our guides inform us that not far from here, there's a suitable place. Having arrived at our campsite, we first tend to the camels as they have carried both ourselves and our luggage for several hours through the unforgiving heat. We've now grown accustomed to the life of the nomad, thus the unloading of the animals takes less time than at the outset of our journey. Our first encounters with the Harandoa have already made quite an impression on us, even though we've not yet reached our destination. Our guides are intrigued by our small tent. Not only do they seem to be fascinated by the tent, they're even a little amused by it. The majority of the Hadendor still live very traditional and reclusive lives. Therefore, comforts such as this are completely foreign to these remote regions. Several children and young women from a nearby farm village have come to see us. Here, foreigners are a rare sight.
Despite the strong winds and intense heat, farmers still cultivate their fields here. They're oblivious to the climate in this part of Africa, where man has survived for several thousands of years. The farmers are busy sowing the fields. By way of a stick, a hole is made in the ground at regular intervals. The next man spreads the seed. The most commonly cultivated plant in this part of the Sudan is the sorghum, that is also known as the durra. Durra, a kind of millet, is not only used as a vital source of food, its stems are also used in the manufacture of fabric. The entire family takes part in this work. Early the next morning, we continue our journey to the homeland of the legendary Hadendoa warriors. Now the saddling and loading of the camels has become far easier. We've gradually adapted to the methods of the ancient caravans that once traveled these deserts and mountains. Camels have also replenished themselves with water. When it comes to a lack of food and water, they're the true survival specialists. A camel can survive without water for up to two weeks. And wallowing in mud holes is a cooling treat. Although the mud dries quickly in the sun, it's also very refreshing. The camel has a rather unique ability to control its own body temperature, so it requires little water. The camel begins to sweat when its body temperature exceeds more than 41 degrees. The camel is made for life in the desert. Its ability to store water has gradually improved over time. The cacti are also masters of survival in extreme conditions, such as those here in northern Sudan. Due to their enormous height, some species are similar to trees, while others impress with their beautiful flowers. In this region, these succulents contain few flowers. They have developed the ability to store water for long periods. The cactus is one of the world's younger plants, as it's only a few million years old. Both its external appearance and its height can vary quite a lot, and its diameter can extend from 5 millimeters up to 30 centimeters. However, when the rain eventually falls, nature once again finds a foothold. New life grows on the brown, dusty sand.
The splendid cactus flowers can only be admired for a few days. The colorful spectacle of the local fauna starts to fade. The dust returns, along with the tremendous heat that soon kills off the brief life of the desert's flowering period. Our guides inform us that we're close to our destination. Strange rock formations formed by the erosive forces of wind and rain highlight our apprehension. The warriors of Haddon Dur could appear at any moment. After some time, we eventually spot a bird, a sure sign that there is vegetation here, such as the various cacti that we had seen earlier. But still nothing. Just a few birds that accompany us on our journey through this mountain world. Judging by the bushes on the rocky hills, there must be more frequent rainfall than in the lower regions of the desert that we crossed a few days ago. Suddenly, we notice more animals. Several donkeys race away while being chased away by a young shepherd. The young boy seems to be responsible for a small herd of goats that he controls by throwing stones until the animals eventually disappear from view. We continue our journey. After a few steps we notice something else. Suddenly, there's water. This is like a kind of wadi. The further we travel into the river valley, the greener the scenery becomes. Some of the surrounding rocks are flat and circular, a reminder of the power of water that has formed both this landscape and also created a unique habitat. The contrast between the severe rock walls and the water below could not be more impressive. The remarkable beauty of nature in this magical place is quite amazing. An oasis of life amid utter isolation. This mountain area has lost none of its threatening appearance. The terrain here would be perfect for an ambush. But today there's no hint of the bloody events that once took place in this region. Now, all is peaceful. The wadi seems to be under the control of the African fauna. There are even some pelicans. These and other striking waterfowl, including some rare heron, are proof that the water here is not only pure, but also rich in fish. The children of a nearby village have developed their own technique for catching fish by beating the water with sticks. They proudly display their catch after having shown off their unusual fishing technique.
The rocky terrain is also an ideal habitat for various kinds of reptile that rest on the hot rocks until they can find somewhere cool to hide from the sun. And there's no lack of food for these fascinating reptiles. The biodiversity of insects in the Wadi Abad Moya is surprisingly vast. Some specimens, such as this variety of moth, can grow to an amazing size during its short lifespan. Despite its relatively small size, from an evolutionary point of view, the ant is one of the most successful creatures in the world. The ant has existed since the Cretaceous period that began around 135 million years ago and ended some 70 million years later. Age-wise, the ant is overshadowed by the turtle that in its approximately 200 million year history has changed very little and is even to be found in this wadi. Belonging to the reptile family, the snake has fallen victim to the hunting exploits of the Harandoa. Here, there's nothing to show of the catastrophes caused by drought in the peripheral areas of the Sahara. Even though some sections of the riverbed can dry out, in other parts of the Wadi Abad Moya, or Valley of Water, there is water throughout the year. Before continuing our journey, we replenish our supply of water. We also wash our dishes. Engrossed in our work, we haven't noticed that we're not alone here and that others have been attracted to this magical riverbed. We take in the tranquility of this wonderful location, even though we're being observed by some of the local people. marvelous to feel the cool water on our skin, a refreshing experience. Suddenly, we're surrounded. Without a sound, several mounted Harandoa warriors have approached us. The atmosphere is anything but relaxed. Our uncertainty seems to please the warriors who, mounted on camels, are truly menacing. In the past, the British Army also experienced the wrath of these people. The looks on the faces of the Harandoa further increases the tension. Finally, after what seems like several minutes, we tentatively step forward. In broken Arabic, we try to explain to the warriors that we have journeyed far to meet them. Our initial skepticism is replaced by a long and amicable handshake with their leader that sets our fears to rest. Our 
our initial concerns were not without reason, as in the 19th century, the Harandur were well known as expert swordsmen who fought alongside the famous sheikh and religious leader Muhammad Ahmad El Mahdi. The traditional weapons of these warriors have hardly changed. In addition to the long swords and bent daggers, their shields are also very impressive. They're made from the skin of the hippopotamus. Today's mock battle is only a demonstration and is part of their greeting ritual. The difference to the battles that we had witnessed previously is plain to see. These men are the true descendants of the heroic warriors of the former Al-Mahdi kingdom. Immediately after their display of skill, the Harandur climb back onto their camels and ride off towards Akik. They vanish as quickly as they had arrived. With their permission, we remain here and begin to search for the other members of their tribe. While setting up camp, there's a sudden and dramatic change in the weather. A loud rumbling can be heard, the sky becomes darker, and a strong wind begins to blow. It's the beginning of a storm. We load our equipment. During heavy rainfall, our present location could be life-threatening. Water could accumulate at great speed and turn into a deadly current. But today, the sky only contains menacing dark clouds and a few brief showers. As a precaution, we've moved out of the danger zone of the riverbed. Although we've been spared a heavy downpour, the temperature is beginning to plummet. The storm has moved on. It will turn into a sandstorm deep in the Sahara, and day will be transformed into night. Soon our tent is in place. There are only a few kilometers lying between us and our destination. This will most likely be our last camp before we meet with the women of the renowned Harandoa tribe. We have apparently camped close to some nomads. Next morning we meet a number of women who are in search of firewood. The women also tend to the cattle. First, the Harandoa women are somewhat shy, but this is hardly surprising as they've been kept away from strangers. It is forbidden for them to talk to other men. The life of the people is dictated by a strict code of conduct. We experience some communication problems as the people here speak an Arab dialect that is difficult to understand. However, 
it is eventually explained where the women are camped and where the rest of the village people live. The splendid attire of the Hadendoa women is as beautiful as the robes worn by the men. The traditional clothing is reminiscent of the Indian sari and highlights the natural charm and beauty of these enigmatic and dignified women. Their clothing is beautifully decorated with embroidery. Unlike the Bedja tribe who have gradually settled in one place, the laws of Islam are less important for the nomads. In recent centuries, life for the Hadendoa has hardly changed. They still traverse the Sudan as herdsmen and live in simple tents. Now the women seem to have lost their initial shyness. Their hospitality is amazing even though the Salif is within their jurisdiction. We improve our communication skills by making various gestures. During the course of our discussion, we discover much about the traditions and everyday life of the tribe. To our surprise, we discover that the life of the Hadendoa is influenced by a matriarchal hierarchy in which most responsibilities are undertaken by the women. Even the setting up of the tents is done by the women. They also run the household and are responsible for the children's upbringing. Thus, women play a vital role within the village community. Even though each tribe is led by a man, he only possesses a relatively small amount of power. His position is mainly nominal. Here men are not very influential. The next leader of the tribe will not be of his descent, but that of his sister. Only a few kilometers away, we come across yet another small community, a Bedouin camp. Unlike their neighbors, this group of people belongs to the nomads of the Harandoa that are on the move throughout the entire year, led by the onset of each season. From the very first moment, this tribe is surprisingly open and cordial. Children struggle to position themselves in front of the camera. The time has come for us to say farewell. The women return to their work and the everyday life of the Bedouin starts again. Despite the harsh living conditions and hardly any natural resources, the north of Sudan has been populated for more than 4,000 years by the tribes of the Beja. Since that time, the Hadendoa have seen many new leaders come and go, and they have always enjoyed freedom. In the past, the determination and courage of this ancient people and their remote habitat have proved to be an almost invincible combination. Over the years, their constant struggle for survival has toughened them and made them even stronger. 
Yet the hospitality and friendliness of these nomads is something that we shall never forget. Surrounded by desert and the Red Sea Mountains and cut off from most of the influences of modern civilization, the modern Haddon Doer tribe has somehow managed to maintain its original cultural identity and freedom.